Hey guys, I hope once again you're having a wonderful Sunday morning or evening or afternoon or whenever it is you're watching this video. Uh, once again, I know that this is not what we had planned and hoped for this Sunday. Uh, I was hoping we'd be able to be back in person, but rather than talk about how much this sucks, let's just jump right in and we'll back up. I do ask once again, remind you to pray for uh, myself and the session as we meet tonight. Uh, to discuss and well, for, for a regular meeting, but to also discuss what we're going to do as we move forward in wake of uh, you know the the virus and then how it continues to to just go up and up and up around here. So be in prayer for us and uh, the session leadership of the church as we try to navigate these waters. Uh, but rather again than talk about how much all this stinks, let's just jump right in some scripture this morning. And uh, today we're going to be reading the passage from Matthew chapter twenty five verses 14 through 30. And, you know, I think rather than me read all of this, uh, I think I, if you would like to, you can pause the video right now. You like that? And you can read Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30 by yourself. And I'm just going to kind of jump in. Uh, we're talking about this parable in Matthew this morning, and it's known as the parable of the bags of gold. Uh, this is a fairly familiar parable for, for many of us, but I'd be willing to bet that many of us have heard this parable talked about as the parable of the talents. There's even a similar parable to this one contained in Luke's gospel, but it has some pretty major differences. Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel have some pretty major differences, but that's for another sermon for another day. But for many of us, we have heard this parable explained as the parable of the talents, and that's because the word that's translated in Matthew as bag of gold, uh, is actually the word talent. And I've always heard this parable taught in that way, using a play on the word talent. You know, a, a talent equals our ability and, and our gift, right? It's, and I've heard this passage preached about in a way that, that encourages us to use our gifts and our abilities, our talents, for God. And, and I completely agree with that. I think that that's a fantastic usage of or way to teach this passage. Um, however, when we read this parable in its original context, I think that Jesus is teaching about something a little bit deeper here. And I want to kind of explore that this morning. First of all, uh, this is the third of four stories that Jesus tells back to back to back to back in Matthew's gospel that all deal with his return. All of these four stories have to do with how people spend their time until Jesus returns. And our text this morning is, is absolutely no different. It starts with a man going on a journey. We aren't told how long of a journey he's, he's going on or, or how long he's going to be gone. We aren't privy to when he's going to come back. We just know that he will at some point return. But before he leaves, he calls three of his servants to come see him. We actually, well, this was actually pretty common practice during the day. It was a way of kind of getting his affairs in order before he left and, and being sure that the things that he had were properly taken care of while he's gone. We, we do the same thing. If you think about it, if we go on a long trip somewhere nowadays, we like to get our affairs in order and, and all that stuff before we leave. And, and this master did just that, but he did so in, in, a, in a pretty unique way to one of the three servants that he called to him, he gave them five bags of gold, or talents. To the other, he gave two bags of gold, and to the third one, he gave one bag of gold. Seems pretty nice, right? The man's going all out of town for a while, and he decides to give his servants a few bags of gold before he leaves. Seems like a pretty nice thing to do. But things get pretty interesting when we realize just what this bag of gold is and what really happened here. You see, a, a, a talent, which again is the original word that's used here, is an actual monetary measurement. It is a measurement of money. As a matter of fact, it's a measurement of gold or silver. It's, it's a pretty big measurement too. A talent is approximately 75 pounds worth of gold. Or to put it in a different way, it's, it's about 15 to 20 years worth of wages. 15 to 20 years worth of wages. In today's world, a single talent 
which is, again, 75 pounds of gold, is worth over $2 million. We're talking about an absolutely astoundingly generous gift here. A truly life-changing gift. These, the servant who received five talents was just handed over $10 million. And the neat thing is that the man, just he just gives it to him. He doesn't tell them what to do with it. He doesn't, he doesn't even take them. He doesn't even tell them what not to do with it. He just gives them this incredible life-changing gift gift. He just freely gives it to them. It doesn't come with any stipulations, no rules or agreements. They don't have to sign anything, nothing. Just this incredible, incredibly generous, life-changing gift. And as soon as he leaves town, the two guys who had received multiple bags of gold, they put it straight to work. And before you know it, they had both doubled what they'd been given. But the poor guy who only received $2 million dollars the guy who only got 75 pounds worth of gold, he went out, he dug a hole, and he buried every last penny of it, which, which honestly was the safest thing he could have done in the first century world. This is exactly what people would do with money. With, with they had big, large sums of money to be safe, they would dig a hole and bury it so you know people couldn't take it and it would be safe for their keeping. He didn't want to take any risks at all with, with this lavish gift that he'd been given. But eventually the master returns and he wanted to check on his servants and see how they'd been doing with these lavish gifts that he had left them with. The first guy says, Master, you had trusted me with five bags of gold. You, you had trusted me with $10 million and I turned that into five more bags of gold. I turned 10 bags into, I turned five bags into 10 bags. I went from $10 million to $20 million with what you'd given me. The master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your master's happiness. The second guy says, you entrust me with two bags of gold. And look, I turned that two bags into four bags. The guy says once again, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the guy who had only received one bag of gold, his, his turn rolls around and he, he walks up and he immediately says, I, I know you're a hard man, harvesting where you don't sow and gathering where you have not scattered seed. I was so afraid of you that I went out and I dug a hole. I hid everything. Didn't use a penny of it, but here it is. It's all there, just like you gave it to me every last cent. But based on the story so far, does the, does the guy's description of the master, does it, does it really fit? A hard man who sows where he, or gathers where he hasn't sowed? The master had just given him $2 million. He had given him 15 to 20 years worth of wages, just gave it to him. Does that sound like something the man that he just described would do? doesn't sound like a hard or mean man. To me, that sounds like the most generous, loving, and giving man that has ever existed on the face of the earth. What an incredibly lavish gift to just give someone. It kind of sounds like his fear of the master was a bit unwarranted, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like he acted in fear when he probably shouldn't have. Nonetheless, the master says, you lazy and wicked servant, you assumed all these bad things about me and you did nothing with what I had given you. You could have at least put it in the bank and got a little bit of interest on it or something, anything, but you did nothing with this life-changing gift. He then had the worthless servant thrown out into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, as Matthew records it. Now, this phrase, weeping and gnashing of teeth, is really an interesting phrase. This phrase only appears in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, it only appears in Matthew and Luke in the New Testament. And the phrase is only found seven times in the entire Bible. When I was a kid, this phrase kind of scared me. I heard this phrase, weeping and gnashing of teeth, and I had all these visions in my head, and it was even taught to me to talk about hell, but, but that's, that's really not what Jesus is referring to here. Jesus isn't talking about hell at all here, or really any of the other six times it appears in the New Testament. That's not what the phrase means. The phrase, weeping and gnashing of teeth, is symbolic of utter despair 
and regret. And, then, and in this instance specifically, the servant is left to feel despair and regret because of what he, what he didn't do. All he's left with is regret, regret for not doing what he could have done or something or anything with this incredible gift that he had been given. Does that make sense? The other servants got to share in their master's happiness, but, but the one who did nothing, all he got to do, or excuse me, all he was left with was regret and despair because he didn't do anything with what he had been freely given. Because he did nothing with this life-altering gift, he was left with huge, massive amounts of despair and regret. He, fir- he saw firsthand the incredible things that could happen when, when, when the gift was put to use, but he did nothing with what he had been given. What a powerful parable that Jesus tells here as Matthew records it, but what does it mean for us this morning. You know, as I thought about this parable this week, I couldn't help but think about the guy who did nothing, the guy who wasted his gift. Because like him, each and every one of us through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, we've all been given a completely free and life-changing gift, just freely given to us through Christ. Through Christ, we have been given life. Through Christ, we have been given life, this incredibly generous and lavish gift. The question is, what are we doing with it as we wait for Christ to return? Because as long as we have breath in our body, As long as there's life in our bones, we have the ability to put what God has given us to work. As long as we're breathing and living, we have the ability to put what God has given us, our life, to work for God. God doesn't call us to just sit on this incredible gift of life. God calls us to use our life. God calls us to do things for Him. God calls us to glorify Him with our life in all that we do, not just in what we don't do. So often we get caught up in, well, I'm not a bad person. I don't do this or I don't do that. I I don't kill or I don't steal and I don't cheat. I, I don't do these things. But God doesn't just call us to not do things. God calls us to live a life for him. So ask us this morning, Are we truly using the life that we have been given? Are we truly living for God? Or are we just sitting on this incredible gift, doing nothing, riding the fence as we wait for Christ to return? May we live for Christ in such a way that when he does return, we aren't left with feelings of despair and regret, but rather may we live in such a way that when Christ does come back, we get to share in God's happiness, knowing that we did everything we could to glorify God and how we lived, not just in what we didn't do. I love you guys. I miss you guys. I look forward to seeing you soon. I hope you have a great Sunday.